work on domesticated birds using them as a model to find out genetic basis of traits. Uh, and today I will focus on uh, specifically genetic basis of carotenoid coloration. So canaries are a really amazing model to study many uh, traits and all the phenotypic variation. They, they can have completely different colors, white, red, yellow. Uh, they also can have different postures, such as you see here, like really weird uh, bird. That's Kipperlicus italicus, really strange one. Um, and then uh, they also can have different vocalizations, the, the bridge that were selected for different kind of songs. And what we were interested in was to find out what are the genes underlying specific phenotypes. So to do this kind of study, first we had to find out the model that was the the good um, uh, a good model to to look at the trait. So for example, to look uh, to look at the uh, genetic basis of carotenoid deposition, we compared basically the the yellow canary that deposit uh, carotenoids in the feathers with the uh, white uh, recessive birds. Uh, and then we did the, the genome scan. So we look across the genome uh, to find out the regions that were under selection. And for, for some of the traits, we knew uh, from the crosses and from the knowledge that was collected by the breeders, if the trait is dominant or, or recessive. So that was uh, very helpful to look for the causative mutation. And once we found that, we did uh, the functional validation. So for example, cloning the specific isoform to the uh, fibroblast uh, chicken cells and then expressing uh, well, exp expressing that, that isoform and checking if the carotenoids were acquired or not to the tissue. And finally, to try to link um, the genes with the biological functions and further evolutionary implications. Uh, and I'm going to present you uh, three different studies that they were all already published. Uh, so the first one is the white recessive canary that was published in PNAS. Uh, and as I said, we did the whole genome scan and looking here at the uh, genetic differentiation, so FST, uh, we found out here the, the candidate region that was uh, located in chromosome 15. And within the, that region, there was uh, genes CARB1, and that is Kavanga receptor class B member one. Uh, so we concluded that there was a good candidate gene for the white recessive uh, phenotype. Uh, and then doing uh, different uh, PCRs, we figured out that there was a splice size mutation. So basically, uh, the birds can produce four different isoforms. And then in the yellow, the most common isoform is the Y type, basically. And in white recessive, the Y type is absent. And then it has like uh, three different isoforms, but the most abundant is the isoform four. And isoform four is the one that is missing the exon four. Um, and then uh, we did the, the functional assay. So uh, cloning that isoform, well, comparing the, the cloned isoform, like the wild type, and uh, versus the isoform 4, so exon 4 deficient isoform or SCAR1, we, we confirm that actually, if you look here, um, the cells that are wild type, the, they uh, absorb the carotenoids, whereas the control, so the fluorescent protein uh, control, and then the uh, isoform 4, version, um, they don't acquire carotenoid. So that, that was a good um, confirmation that indeed this gene is involved in the uh, carotenoid metabolism. Uh, and then um, we concluded that uh, scarp one scavanger receptor is an essential mediator of expression of carotenoid-based coloration in birds. Um, and uh, since this gene was also implicated to be important in lipid metabolism, we managed to get a potential link between visual display and uh, lipid metabolism. 
Uh, and finally, since CARB1 was shown, uh, like also I think in Drosophila, or uh, so this means that it's a really Asian and concerned meha uh, mechanism uh, of carotenoid uptake in animals. The second study, uh, we look at the bird part coloration. So here on, in the top, you can see the Urukum uh, canary breed. So the difference here in the portrait is basically that the, the top bird have like very intensive red beak, whereas the bird in the bottom has like, well, regular, like yellowish, white, whitish beak. Uh, and it was not only in the beak, but it was also in, in, the, um, in the legs, in the skin, but uh, the most visible like for the picture was this beak. Uh, and again, ah, and then it was also important that we compare the Urukum birds with the red birds because the Urukum birds were selected uh, from the red birds. But there is a second um, type of this uh, Urukum birds, and they are also yellow. So what we did, we looked at the uh, genome again, and then we found out uh, the. Uh, candidate peak, and then uh, that was a little bit disappointment because in that region there is BCO2 gene located. And BCO2 was already shown many times to be uh, related with carotenoid uh, coloration, especially in tissues such as skin or fat. Uh, but then that was quite interesting that we found out the emissions mutation. So basically, looking across the phylogeny, none other species having uh, BCO2 had uh, this amino acid. Uh, and then we did the, the protein modeling, and we showed that actually this amino acid change causes stru a structural distortion of the protein, and that leads to observed lo loss of activity. So again, to do the functional validation, uh, we uh, uh, again cloned the, the BCO2 different versions, the wild type and the mutated one. And here you can see that the wild type is the, the blue one. So basically from this, there is no substrate um, after the reaction, there, there are apocarotenoids, so the products of disruption of the big carotenoids. But in the mutated and denaturated uh, BCO2, you see that there is a lot of sub substrate and then there's no apocarotenoids, no product. So basically the, the BCO2, it's not, uh, not functional. So we concluded that uh, carotenoid cleaving activity leads to gain, uh, coloration gain modification or loss. And then uh, we also uh, analyze the retinas because um, apparently uh, carotenoid, well, th they have the, the pigments in the, in the retina. Uh, so um, this mutation in BCO2 actually affects uh, like how, how the pigment looks like. So it, it, in the end, uh, it tunes the sensitivity of the photoreceptors. Uh, and then finally, uh, we showed interplay of the signaling benefits, physical costs uh, that uh, might be mediated by regulation of BCO2. And then uh, a final study published like uh, one week ago, I think in science, uh, we, we used as a model mosaic canary. So that is the breed that uh, was created by crossing canary with red siskin. And then in this way, the sexual dichromatism, so the fact that the male has much more carotenoid coloration than the female was introduced, because normally uh, canaries are monochromatic, so the males and females are the same. So that was really good model to, to try to figure out like how the, the dichromatism can be regulated. Uh, and again, we did the, the whole genome scan. We look at, at FSC, and we also look at, at FD statistics, so the fraction of uh, the genome shared through introgression, because we knew that the trade was introgressed from other species. And here you can see our candidate uh, region. And, co uh, and then um, 
there was other significant pick, and that was caused by the fact that we used both the red and yellow birds. And this uh, region in the genome uh, was shown before to be associated with red coloration. And it, indeed, once we removed the, the birds that are red, the, the signal disappeared. And then that was again, well, I don't know if disappointment, but at the time that was a big surprise because that was the third project in our lab with BCO2. So it was this Urukum carnary I spoke before, but there was also one more project on the lizards. And in the lizards, we also found a BCO2. <laughs> um, but then uh, we, uh, yeah, so we narrowed down the region genotyping, the, the individuals. And then there were, we didn't find any um, coding mutations, so we, we look at the gene regulation. So here you can see different assays. Uh, so the, uh, males had, uh, the females had more expression uh, than the males in the tissue where there was the difference in the coloration. Uh, we, so since we didn't see any coding changes, we hypothesized that that was regulatory mutation. So we did the allelic imbalance assay, looking at the proportion of the alleles uh, expressed in the carrier individual. And there was a strong uh, bias towards the cisskin allele. And then finally, we uh, did in situ. So in the pigmented follicle, you can see that there is no BCO2 expression, whereas in unpigmented follicle, there is a lot of expression. So the more BCO2 expressed, the more it's active and the, the less carotenoids. So we concluded that dichromatis in birds can be generated by simple uh, molecular mechanism driven by large effect gene that exert the function in the peripheral tissue. And finally, it seems that uh, carotenoid signaling might be shaped more by cellular processes than resource limitations. So in summary, I showed you three different breeds, three different phenotypes. And then uh, all of them uh, had simple genetic basis. And uh, th there were different genes in, uh, involved, so it's CARB1 and BCO2. Uh, also, like the different types of mutations, so splice size mutation, missense mutation, and regulatory. And then the origin was also different. So they were either de novo mutation or in progression. And I would like to uh, thank all my collaborators, especially my supervisor, Miguel Carneiro, my co-supervisor, Leif Anderson and Ricardo Lopez, and everyone else who was involved in the study and all my fundings. And I will be very happy to answer your questions. OK, great. Um... Uh, today I'm going to be talking about plasticity and genetic adaptation, uh, specifically a hypothesis about that phenotypic plasticity could facilitate adaptation. And this hypothesis goes back to Mark Baldwin back in the 1800s, who proposed that plasticity can actually facilitate survival of organisms in a new environment. So plasticity let them get to a, an environment they hadn't been previously been, able, been in before. But then once they're in that environment, not selection and adapt the organisms um, in the direction of the induced plastic response. So it adapts them to that new environment. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about is an example of some work that I did at Pisgah Lava Flow, which is a recently formed volcanic crater in Southern California. That's only about 22,000 years old. Um, and the star of the show is several lizards that live on the lava flow and, and surrounding habitat. And they're melanic coloration, so they're dark black. Um, which is obviously an advantage for them being cryptic to um, escape from predators. Um, and their phenotype is very distinct from the lizard just collected seven kilometers away. Also, the pure lizard is dark black and the off lava lizard is kind of uh, light, light tan. Um, however, the story gets a little bit interesting when you uh, look at the phenotype of the Pisgah lizards uh, on different substrates. So the, these lizards are able to plastically alter their color phenotype. So this is the same lizard. Um, when it caught in the field, it was dark black, and then kept on sand for four months. It had a drastic change in its coloration. Uh, so um, this plasticity had been known about before I did this study, and this was work done by my collaborator, Claudia Luke, and she showed that both the Pisgah and off-lava lizards 
dark and lighten depending on the substrate coloration. So she did an experiment where she collected lizards from both on and off the lava flow, kept on kept groups of them on either lava or sand for a whole year to kind of standardize the environment. And then she switched them to a new substrate. So this is looking at lizards that were kept on lava for a year and then switched to sand. And the y-axis here is uh, a measure of the coloration of the lizards from dark to light. And so you can see basically after the substrate was switched, uh, the lizards got lighter in coloration when they were moved to sand. And then for the group that was kept on sand for a year and switched to lava, they got darker over time when they were switched to the lava environment. And this was true for both the off lava and the Pisgah lizards. Uh, one thing to notice uh, actually about the initial conditions of this experiment was after the off lava and Pisgah lizards had been kept on uh, lava for a year, the Pisgah lizards were significantly darker than the off lava lizards. Um, so this suggests that even with the plasticity, uh, there may be some sort of genetic difference between the two populations for coloration. Uh, this is kind of further reinforced by some genetic crosses that I had done between these two populations. So I crossed Pisgah lizards to Pisgah lizards and Pis lizards to off lava lizards and also off lava lizards to off lava lizards. And this is looking at the phenotypes of the hatchlings resulting from those crosses where the hatchlings were raised in a, uh, hatched in a common environment. So again, the scale here is from dark to light. And this is the um, pure lava crosses versus the pure off lava crosses. And there were significant differences in the coloration of these hatchlings. Um, um, the egg. So before any environmental differences, there needs to be some sort of coloration difference between the two populations. Uh, so to get back at this question, adaptation, what I was trying to answer, has genetic change actually followed this ancestral plasticity in these side blotched lizards? Uh, to do this, I a number of about 16,000 genes um, in 52 individuals from the Pisgah population and 52 individuals from the nearby off lava site. So uh, this is showing a PC plot of the genetic variation for these two populations with Pisgah here in black and the off lava population here in tan. And so you can see easily that the populations are differentiated. However, the level of genetic differentiation between them is pretty low. So the mean FST was only 0 0.02. Um, this is another way of visualizing the genetic differences. So, so this is a site frequency spectrum. So it's plotting uh, how much the allele frequencies are correlated between the off lava alternative alleles and the Pisgah alternative alleles. Uh, and the alternative alleles are just based on uh, relative to the reference sequence that I had, where the cool colors are representing fewer sites and the warm colors are representing more sites. Um, basically, the one of the key things to take away from this is that for most genetic sites, the allele frequencies are highly correlated between the two populations. Um, of course, some genes you can see here are uh, deviating from that, so there are some allele frequency differences between the populations, but there's no fixed differences um, between these two populations. Um, so another way to uh, look at this genetic variation between the two populations is looking at FST. So these are estimates of the per site, uh, F, uh, estimates of FST for each SNP. And so as I mentioned before, the mean FST uh, in red here is pretty low. And then there's a, a tail of the distribution. And what I'm going to be focusing on are two genes that um, were in this tail of the FST distribution called PRKAR1A. And I'll talk more about what these genes are. But um, they exhibit more differentiation than, other, uh, than most other um, genes between the populations. Uh, Another thing I noticed about these this PrEP and PRKA or 1A genes is the, the variant that was associated with the population differentiation was also only found in the Pisgah population and not in the off lava population. So I wanted to see if this was how, how much this uh, deviated from sort of like random expectations. And so this is just looking at SNPs that were only found in the Pisgah population. And you can see that for most of these SNPs, if there's variants only detected in the Pisgah population, the uh, allele frequency is pretty low. So that's expected just based on, um, they might've been missed in the initial sequencing of the uh, off lava population. But these two candidate genes, their allele frequency is um, much higher compared to the rest of these genes. And this would 
this high frequency could be consistent with selection between the populations. Uh, so these two genes and, and what might they be doing? So uh, after looking at the genes and sort of the tail of these distributions, these two genes stood out as potentially being involved in the melanin production. So the PEP gene is uh, short for polo endopeptidase, and it uh, digests alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, and that's the hormone that stimulates the production of melanin. So this PrEP gene is acting um, on alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, which in turn binds to MC1R, and PrEP um, results in a truncated version of that alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone. So it could potentially be affecting the amount of signaling for um, melanin in the cell. The other gene, PRKAR1A, is short for protein kinase A regulatory subunit 1A, and it's a regulatory subunit of a larger protein, protein kinase A, that signals melanin production within the cell. So after MP1R, it's part of the signaling cascade that then leads to more melanin. And mutations in this gene are known to be associated with a hyperpigmentation disorder in humans. So both of these are intriguing candidates for um, greater production of melanin. Uh, so to try and test that, uh, the, I have this association between populations, but really the question then is, is this associated with the phenotypes between uh, in, the, in the Pisgah population? And so for this, I turned to the hatchlings that I generated in my crosses that were uh, hatched in a common environment. So I genotyped these hatchling lizards, and then I quantified their coloration. Um, and so this is what I found. So for both the PrEP gene and the PRKAR1A gene, the uh, um, alternate alleles are uh, shown on the right. So the, all the, these genotypes are restricted to um, just the Pisgah population for both of these genes. And then the wild type is AA, um, coincidentally, for both genes. Um, and then we're looking at how dark versus light the lizards are. And so you can see that actually for both genes, there's a significant difference explained by these genotypes where the, um, the alleles are found in the Pisgah population led to darker hatchlings. So this suggests there's a link between genotype and phenotype for both of these genes. Um, I also uh, then scored bar these um, SNPs in a variety of other populations surrounding the Pisgah lava flow. Again, it's into Southern California. And I wasn't able to detect this alternate allele in any of these other populations. So um, in addition to the off-lava population, a lot of other populations don't have this, uh, these alleles, which is at least suggestive of de novo mutations in the Pisgah population. Um, uh, in collaboration with Aaron Stern, uh, I, you know, we worked on some demographic models to try and figure out how old these alleles are and what kind of selection they had been under. And so using FASTIM col 2 and the joint site frequency spectrum for the two populations, um, we estimated that for both genes, the allele age was around a, a, a thousand generations ago, and, this, and, it, and they had undergone strong selection of about 0.7 or 0.8, uh, or no, 0 0.007 or 0 0.008, excuse me. Um, so given the generation time of you know, only maybe one to three years, these mutations likely arose well after the formation of the lava flow um, 22,000 years ago. So just to kind of summarize all that, uh, it seems like in this situation, there was ancestral plasticity in the phenotype, and that probably facilitated the survival of these um, lizards in this novel color environment. And then it's been followed by um, genetic change actually in two genes that alter the color so when they have alternative alleles in the, in the Pisgah population, there you get darker lizards. And so this um, provides a really detailed genetic uh, example of what's known as a Baldwin effect after Mark Baldwin. Um, and there's uh, very few uh, examples of this where the genetics are known, even though it's an old theory. Uh, it supports an idea in the plasticity literature that genes can be followers to plasticity, meaning basically plasticity lets you colonize a new environment and then um, genetic after you're in that new environment. Um, in contrast to some theories in plasticity li literature, the results suggest that these adaptive changes could actually arise from de novo mutations and not from standing uh, genetic variation. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank uh, all my collaborators. So this was work done in the lab of Rasmus Nielsen at Berkeley um, in close collaboration um, at UC Santa Cruz. 
and then and KB at UC Berkeley and Claudia Luke, my collaborator, who did the plasticity experiments, and Aaron Stern, the modeling, and I had a great undergraduate student, Akshara Chala, who helped with a lot of lab work, and then I had a bunch of other help, including a, a herpetology class that went out to collect with me and a bunch of funding. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, and I'm going to be talking today about my dissertation research, which is about um, horizontal transfer um, of cytolethal descending toxin genes in insects. Um, uh, so a lot of the stuff that we discuss in these sort of lectures is about um, vertical transfer, which is when you pass down genes from your parents to your offspring. Um, but my dissertation focuses on something a little bit different, which is um, transfer of genes between different species. So an example that I like to show is um, me, and like I'm from Florida, so I like to show alligators. Um, and basically this idea that if an alligator were to pass down its genes to me, that then I would acquire some weird characteristics like, you know, developing uh, scaly skin or sharp teeth. Um, and even though for we've known for several years about uh, the prevalence of HGT, in bacterial um, fitness. The past 10 years has seen a huge surge of studies demonstrating its role and its importance in animal adaptation. Um, and this little image over here, this is of a deloid rotifer, which was the first animal discovered to have a lot um, of gene transfer. And then some of my other favorite examples are this tick, which acquired genes that help it suck blood, um, as well as stick and leaf insects, which acquire genes from bacteria that help them better digest plant cell wall material. And it turns out that that sort of adaptation where HGT helps um, insects uh, digest plant cell wall material or overcome their toxins is really quite common. And that was the motivation behind uh, me looking for horizontal gene transfer in our lab model system, uh, a fly called Scatomyza flava or the wasabi fly. And um, the way that we, do, because they recently evolved herbivory, um, we thought that it might be a good candidate for this. So the way that we conducted this analysis is we did something called an alien index analysis, uh, which involves taking all the identified genes in the genome um, and blasting them to like the NCBI and figuring out whether those genes have higher number of hits to eukaryotic or to prokaryotic viruses, um, to pro prokaryotes or bacteria or viruses. And the idea is that if um, more of these hits uh, correspond to prokaryotic uh, sequences, and that's a good indicator that that could be horizontal gene transfer. So um, after this analysis, we didn't find evidence of transfer of any genes related to herbivory, but we did find one called cytolethal descending toxin B, um, meaning that the initial hypothesis was incorrect, but I did have a new direction in which to take my dissertation. A little bit about what CTB does. Uh, it's usually secreted by pathogenic bacteria, um, where it's known to be considered like very deleterious toward um, eukaryotic cells. So in this image over here, this is a normal happy cell, and this is a cell that's been intoxicated with CDTB. The idea being that following intoxication, they're trying to divide and they can't, um, and then eventually the cell will just die. Take away, it's bad for animal cells. But there is one really interesting example in which CDTB is known to confer actually a protective advantage to eukaryotes. Um, and that happens in aphids. So I don't know if you can see over here, this is an image of an aphid that is getting destroyed by a parasitoid wasp. Um, it's laying an egg inside. And what's going to happen is that it lays the egg, and then that little egg becomes a baby wasp. And that baby wasp eats the aphid alive kind of like alien until the very end, you have an adult wasp emerging from like the mummified husk of the aphid. Um, however, aphids are not entirely defenseless to this sort of attack. Some of them have these beneficial bacterial endosymbionts called Hamiltonella defensa, which secrete this protein, CDTB. And those that have CDTB are more likely to survive attack from parasitoid wasps. So I thought this was super interesting and I wanted to know the extent to which CDTB seemed prevalent in insects. Um, so I did blast searches of all the NCBI databases and every single transcript and genome I could find, eventually identifying it in four different lineages of insects. Uh, Scaptomyza, which I mentioned, uh, this group called Ananasse subgroup species, Drosophila biarmapes, as well as in uh, this aphid clade called Mysis. And these are all pretty far apart on an evolutionary tree. 
And then in order to figure out how uh, this fit into like a larger evolutionary context, I created just a protein phylogeny. And everything here in blue uh, is viral bacterial CDTB sequences. And then in this little group nested within here, this little pink area, these are all the insect sequences, showing a lot of phylogenetic conflict because you have like this one group nested within this larger group. And when I zoom in over here to this area, what this shows is that um, all these insect clades form one group um, next to Hamiltonella defensa, suggesting that at one point, uh, maybe 40 million years ago, a uh, Hamilton defensa, an ancestor, might have transferred CDTB into the genome of one of these insects. And because syngeny is conserved within these different insect groups, it suggests that this might have happened at least four different times. Of course, one problem that you might have heard of is that horizontal gene transfer can easily be mistaken with bacterial contamination. Um, this is what happened with tardigrades, actually. And I really didn't want that to happen to me. So I was pretty rigorous in my QC methods to make sure this wasn't the case. So I checked read depth. I was looking at the scaffolds to make sure there were other eukaryotic genes, looking at syngeny, canonical eukaryotic motifs like introns and tata box. I did PCR from the body, PCR from the legs. And um, everything was validated with Sanger sequencing. So I felt pretty convinced that it was not contamination. I got out of breath there. Um, and now that I had validated it, I felt very confident. I wanted to know what on earth is it doing in this genome? Because it's very weird. This is a bacterially derived gene that is known for killing animals and it's encoded being used by an animal. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do is see whether or not this function that it has, this DNA, so it chops up DNA, still holds. Um, so I made an alignment of uh, different insect CDTB sequences and also bacterial CDTB sequences. And even though, for the most part, these proteins are very highly divergent, um, there's very high conservation of the important catalytic residues, which um, was cool. And then after, uh, I actually did in vitro assays with purified CTB insect protein, and I found that, in fact, uh, this conserved structure is manifest as conserved function. So in this DNA assay, I have um, these volumes of DNA, and as I add increasing quantities, of the CDTB protein, uh, we see that the that the DNA starts degrading, which uh, makes sense if it is a DNA. And then the thing that's most interesting in kind of evaluating its function in a biological or organismal context is by it's looking at the expression data in the life stage of this animal. So I took two different uh, Drosophila species, um, and I did RTQPCR on this gene, and, and I saw that CDTB is most highly expressed in both species in the larval forms. And actually there were different studies with different, several different independent replicates also showing this pattern. Um, and then the thing is that because Drosophila larvae, that is the stage most susceptible to parasitization, this led me to think that maybe this could be because um, CDTB plays a role in parasitoid defense, much like it just does in that earlier example that I shared with aphids. This work was, um, also assisted by Mariana Corayoria, um, a postdoc in our lab. And so what I wanted to do is actually test this, functionally demonstrate this. Uh, so I used CRISPR to create loss of function mutations in CD2B in this one species, Drosophila ananasae. And I just used a very simple approach. I co-injected three guide RNAs, one targeting each exon. And eventually after a year, um, I have three homozygous mutant lines that have small indels or large deletions that should presumably uh, mean that CDTB, the function, is totally bankrupt. Um, so now that I had that, uh, my hypothesis is that these loss of function mutate mutants, uh, they should, if CDTB plays a role in protecting them from wasps, um, you would expect that the knockouts should be more likely to die from wasp infection. And over here, this is an image of a wasp uh, laying, taking out its lar lung ovipositor and sticking it inside a larvae where it'll lay its egg. Um, so I, when I did the study, um, I did it and then, well, I mean, I never got to finish the results because of COVID. However, I did send uh, the wasp over to our Hungarian collaborators and they actually sent me this data about a week ago, so I'm not quite sure what to make of it yet, um, but I'm just gonna show you what I saw. 
um, which is that when we have these CDTD mutants following parasitoid attack, they are less likely, these, these loss of function mutants are less likely to come out or to hatch from their pupil cases after um, the wasps attack them, which for me sounds very promising. But because I got this data a few days ago, um, I still need to really evaluate it. Um, one thing that I discovered about two weeks ago um, when I realized that there was a newly annotated genome for Drosophila and an assay is that this new genome shows that there are actually two CDTB copies in Ananase, which means, or which could mean that the knockouts that I created are not full knockouts, but rather, um, you know, knockouts for one of the genes. So I need to investigate that once we can go back into lab. Um, I also need to redo this experiment uh, when I have proper controls. We need to check to see the survival rates when there is no wasp parasitization at all. And additionally, I do need to consider that these could be because of off-target effects um, of other genes. Nevertheless, I find it very promising and it, I'm looking forward to see what the new data shows. Um, so the main takeaways are that uh, CDTB, which is the DNA that was transferred from bacteria to insects. Um, I think and I'm testing that this might play a role in protection from parasitoid wasps. Um, and the thing that I find so fascinating about the system is that this is an example of a toxin being co-opted by the very organism that it once evolved uh, to destroy. So thank you. I had wonderful support from a bunch of different graduate students and undergrads and postdocs and funding. And thank you all for, um, for listening. All right. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, some work that's been ongoing and uh, starting to uh, have some of this work come out. Um, and this has to do with trying to understand uh, the um, lake by skull, uh, uh, scope and adaptive radiation. And so what I'm there's a lot of collaborators, I'll acknowledge them throughout this and at the end again. Um, but uh, one of the, the first things that I'm uh, going to have to do is introduce by call. Unfortunately, it's it's um, um, in a very interesting place from a biological perspective, but, but not very well studied and, and not very well known. So it, it is one of the, the Great Lakes. And uh, on the next slide, I hope I'll convince you it is the greatest lake uh, that's out there. So uh, normally in North America, we're thinking about our Great Laurentian Lakes. Um, more famously, in terms of thinking about fish adaptive radiations, we think about the um, uh, East African Rift Valley Lakes. Uh, but Baikal is, is nestled nice in the middle, uh, nicely in the middle of Siberia. And um, to convince you that it's a, an interesting place, and I'll show you some interesting fish in a second, uh, it is the largest, deepest, and oldest lake on Earth. So um, we'll get to the depth in a second, but because it is so big, it's, it's estimated to hold about 20% of the world's uh, fresh water. Um, it reaches depths uh, over 1,600 meters, so it is the deepest uh, lake that's out there. But it's interesting in that it, there's oxygenation to those depths, so we can um, observe life to those depths, which there are other great lakes that obtain uh, great depths, but um, there is uh, 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 oxygen depletion as you get deeper, and so you don't actually observe invasion of lower depths. At Baikal, we observe uh, invasion of all depths, and so um, what has happened is it's the only freshwater environment where we observe sort of this really deep water um, uh, invasion and adaptation to deep water environments. So um, there's uh, this again is more common in the marine environment, um, but not really observed in the, the freshwater environment. And uh, we observe things associated with, uh, again, the high pressure of, of being in, at those depths, um, low light environments. Uh, there's there's lots of different challenges that uh, organisms have overcome in uh, establishing themselves in Lake Baikal. Um, so Baikal, while at least the fish people think of it as being famous for the sculpin that have radiated there, um, probably more uh, uh, visible or at least more diverse are the uh, radiations in other invertebrate groups. So um, there are lots of endemic species that have established, become established in Lake Baikal. Um, uh, more famous are the uh, amphipods, where there's over 200 species of amphipods that have um, uh, uh, originated in Lake Baikal. There's uh, various snail um, uh, radiations that have occurred. Uh, there's a very large flatworm uh, radiation that has occurred. Um, for some reason, throw a sponge in there. There's really cool um, 
endemic sponges found in my call, but again, we're interested in the sculpin. And uh, again, depending upon who you talk to and depending upon when our work finally comes out, there's at least 30, 35 species uh, that are found in Lake Baikal. So just to give you a little bit of background on freshwater sculpin, what they look like and um, what has happened in Baikal with these fish when they've invaded um, that environment. These are two of the uh, uh, freshwater species that inhabit, they inhabit the lake, they inhabit the shallows of the lake, but they're, they're more common in the rivers around Baikal. And so these are uh, thought to be the, the ancestral species, are uh, closely related to the ancestral species for the uh, invasion of Baikal. The top there is the genus Pericotus, below it is Laocotus. Um, and if you know anything or have you seen a freshwater sculpin before, they, they, they kind of look like this. There's, there's um, nothing really outstanding about them. They're all very similar looking. Um, and again, um, we have them all throughout North America. They all look very similar unless you're an expert. You, you can't really tell them apart. But when we get in Lake Baikal, we start to observe some interesting um, uh, species that occur there that are endemic to the lake. So this is the genus Procotus. It's a specialist that lives in sponge reefs. Um, and so we see higher coloration, um, smaller size in those species. When we get to uh, the deeper, more benthic habitats in Lake Baikal, we observe uh, a, 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 the widest diversity that, that is in Baikal. So there's a number of genera here. I'll go through sort of how these are related uh, momentarily. But these are all the more benthic bottom dwelling um, and in many instances have colonized the deeper habitats of Baikal. Uh, a group that we are uh, also interested in are species that have evolved a more of a pelagic or a benthopelagic life cycles, uh, lifestyle. So they're living uh, not on the bottom, but living throughout the water column. And up here, this is the genus Um it's, a, it's an interesting group that I'll, I'll come back to at the end that we're, we're following up on some work. But you can see, um, again, differences in the body shape and even um, for those of you familiar with more marine fish, starting to look um, like a small, what we call a bait fish with the, the silver coloration on uh, some of these, and again, having more of a pelagic life cycle, lifestyle, excuse me. Uh, this one in the lower left here is, is probably the more famous or infamous Lake Baikal sculpin. This is the genus Comophorus, also known as the Lake Baikal oil fish. These can live at, at, at the surface. These can live at, live at 1600 meters depth. Um, they are truly neutrally buoyant. They have very high lipid levels, as their name uh, indicates. Um, loss all pigmentation. They're live bearing. These are the weirdos um, in Lake Baikal, one of the more iconic species from this adaptive radiation. And then we do observe the evolution of some larger species. Um, this is the freshwater version of a, of a, blog fi a blobfish, um, uh, Batrachocotus uh, nikolsky. Um, so again, uh, the, the interesting thing here is we are uh, starting out presumably from this river uh, sort of uh, bland uh, uh, sculpin, and we're observing um, the evolution of all of these different forms in Lake Baikal. And so um, we're first off trying to understand phylogenetics of this group, how they're all interrelated, and then uh, eventually uh, being able to move into more uh, sort of functional questions and trying to understand what happens when we get the evolution of pelagic or these, these deep water forms in freshwater systems. So there's been a little bit of work on Lake Baikal sculpin. This is the phylogeny from Kantula way back in 2003, based on a handful of mitochondrial genes. You can see there's not a lot of resolution, not a lot of support. Um, and so again, there's, there's the need to really um, get a good idea of, of how these different groups are related and interrelated within Baikal. Um, there is some evidence um, from Teratina et al. that there are sort of cryptic lineages um, our species within some of these groups. And so that is something else that, that we're um, exploring as we're going through uh, this project here. So for this part of it, kind of in terms of thinking about it, I'll, I'll talk about the phylogenetic reevaluation of the, the Baikal uh, sculpin radiation, um, again, using a more rigorous approach, um, using this to evaluate described species, genera, validity of those, and, and then again, potentially having to go back and, and re revisit the taxonomy uh, of the group. But one of our, our again, sort of endpoint questions is, is trying to get at the origins and adaptations to these really novel lake environments. So in terms of pelagic environments and really deep water environments that we don't observe uh, in many other lake systems, trying to, trying to understand that from a, a genomic perspective. 
Um, so we were able to get out on my call for three years and do some sampling. Um, we uh, sampled most of the genera, um, some uh, more numerous samples than others. Um, and in terms of trying to, to look at the phylogenetics of the group, we have a pretty large data set of single nucleotide polymorphisms from RADSeq. And then we also have, um, with, collaboration, with collaborators at Harvard, um, uh, obtained exome sequences uh, for a subset of the, the species within Baikal. So I'll just um, go through some of the, the uh, um, uh, phylogenies that we observe here. This is a kind of our first one and just some of the big patterns that we're starting to observe. Um, this is again based on, on concatenated SNPs. This is a species tree uh, reconstruction. So there's multiple individuals going to each and in each of these genera here and in case some cases different species that we're looking at. And so um, I only have numbers on um, notes where there's there's low support. Everything else is pretty well supported in this. So um, we aren't in some places we aren't observing really high support, but we'll get back to that in a moment. I just want to point out some of the, the big things that we noticed right off the bat. Um, there are certain genera, these described genera, that probably are not valid. And so there are a number of these, Vitrachocotus, uh, Bisicotus, uh, Neocotus, um, that are, are, are not monophyletic groups, right? And so there's definitely uh, a need to reevaluate um, some of the taxonomy uh, in some of these different groups here. In terms of thinking about the two different pelagic forms that I mentioned earlier, um, we kind of knew this from the mitochondrial DNA, but this is um, validated again their phylogenomic analysis, that there's an independent origin of um, those, and apologies, uh, uh, Google Meeting is hiding the catacoma forest down below um, and the coma forest up above with the, the orange arrows. Those are um, our two different genera where we have um, uh, the evolution of pelagic forms. So this is uh, a nice situation that we have these independent origins of pelagicism and uh, we can use those as sort of replicates to try to understand what's happening from a genomic perspective. And that's where we're um, leading toward, at least with that particular group. Um, the last uh, big uh, uh, observation from uh, the phylogenetic work is that there's a single colonization or invasion of really deep water habitats. So I have a, uh, outlined here all of the genera that contain uh, deeper water species uh, below 500 meters. Uh, that we collect them and find them. And so it, it, it looks like there was a single invasion and radiation into the deep water environment in Baikal as opposed to multiple invasions or potentially um, reinvasions into shallow water environments, which we don't really observe uh, in this group. Um, this is the uh, the phy this phylogeny of the same data set, but just the, with the concatenated SNPs and, and um, constructed using maximum likelihood, so it's not a species tree, rat individual, all the different species on there. The one thing that I, I want to, uh, I can't move this, oh, sorry about that, I can move it. I um, just want to point out is that there is, and this has been observed early on with the mitochondrial DNA, we observe it in all of our data sets where there's these SNPs, the exome data I'll show you in a moment. Um, and um, whole mitre genome sequences that uh, there's really uh, this one group, uh, Laocotus and Catacoma forests, where we observe one of the instances of the evolution of, um, of pelagics or benthopelagics. And we observe really long branches uh, in this group, and it has been observed before, it violates uh, any assumptions when we try to go in and, and do any um, uh, uh, molecular dating or imply a, a molecular clock on this group. Um, and it's something that um, we don't right now have a handle on why this particular lineage has this particular pattern in it. We observe it again across all data sets. Um, this is the exome data set. It is not 100% concordant with the, the SNP uh, data set, so it's, it has fewer taxa in it um, based on the, the sampling scheme, but this is based on uh, 8,000, over 8,000 genes, um, greater than 500 base pair in length. So this is the uh, 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 phylogeny based on that data. And again, we'd still observe um, these really long branch lengths with that. And um, there's some concern that this may bias the position of this group. And um, the main difference between this analysis here and the previous analysis I was showing is the more basal placement of, of Laocotus and Catacoma forests. 
on the, on the previous slide, it is, it is not as basal to the whole by call radiation. And so it is something we are currently trying to tease apart and, and figure out what's going on um, with that particular lineage. Uh, again, some of the initial findings are there needs to be uh, definitely a, a reevaluation for some of these genera. Um, this is here, the Neocotus, uh, Abyssocotus, uh, the Trachocotus, where these are not monophyletic groups. Um, and again, um, going to need to go back in and reassess those and, um, and, and figure out what is, what is happening in some of these groups that, that initially were described as, as being all one thing, but uh, we know um, now from multiple lines of evidence are not. Um, so this does take us to thinking about kind of the next steps in how we would start to look at some of these more interesting questions in Lake Baikal. And so on the left here is just a, a phylogenetic relationships within uh, Laocotus, and then this is Catacoma forest down below. Um, and this is that one of those, those groups that has evolved um, a pelagic uh, lifestyle. And um, we have CT images of the skulls here. Did, in preparing this, I did not acknowledge that is Bucer up at Oregon State who's been helping us with some of this analysis. But um, he's, he's scanning um, uh, all of our samples. And again, we're looking at changes in bone density, bone structure um, from some of these different uh, evolutionary transitions. And um, initially we do observe, so on the right is a, is a heat map imposed over the CT image where the, the darker means it's more dense, the bone. And we can definitely see um, as they move from up here, which is a more um, uh, benthic and, and river uh, adapted species to these more um, benthopelagic species, open water species, we do see reductions in um, bone density. This is something that is observed in, in lots of other groups. Mostly I've been studying a little bit more in marine groups. So um, in the ice fishes, this is something that has been pretty well documented. And so what we are starting to do is to look at the exome data and try to see if what particular genes pathways may be involved in um, reduction in bone density. We've again got two different pelagic groups, uh, Catacomophorus and Comophorus shown right here. So we can look for uh, potential for our, um, our parallel evolution in different genes, different pathways. It's just a preliminary analysis looking specifically at uh, skeletal genes that are under positive selection in those two particular lineages. Um, there is some overlap, um, but not a lot. So it looks like there may be uh, independent uh, mechanisms for the evolution of the pelagic lifestyle um, in those two different lineages. Uh, there are, again, a lot of people involved in this, um, acknowledging them all here. Um, main collaborators, Michael Sandal, University of Western Alabama. Um, there's been, uh, again, funding from NSF, and, and again, without our Russian colleagues, none of this would uh, be possible. So that's all I have for you right now. If there are any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. <laughs>